Vero. Uh, and thanks also to Benoit and the organizers for uh, organizing this great conference. Um, and again, I want to, so this paper is joint with uh, Miguel Cardoso at Brock University, who's up there. Um, we're going to reuse Canadian microdata, so I want to express my uh, thanks to Cedar, uh, especially Beryl and Danny, for making this data available. And the productivity partnership that Mike Veal talked about yesterday that has done great things for increasing data access uh, to academic researchers in Canada. Um, so um, I'll echo what Beryl said. Is For me, I come from more of a macro and trade background, so this has been a very interesting conference for me to, uh, to learn a lot of different things about immigration. Um, so from that perspective, um, the motivation that we come to this paper is uh, there's very large international trade barriers. Firms face big monetary, physical barriers to export their goods to different countries. And more and more, people realize that these barriers also include uh, informational barriers and intangible things. Uh, there's friction, there's information frictions, um, there are networking frictions. You have to, firms have to kind of know the right information and meet or know the right people in order to make contacts to engage in international trade. Um, so there's a few, there's some older and newer work that emphasize the importance of these informational frictions. Uh, and there's some work that is trying to you know, point to the idea that uh, immigrants may be one tool to resolve these frictions. So immigrants have a role in facilitating international trade, um, mainly to the, between the firms in the country where they live and the firms in the country where they're from. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as a trade creation effect of immigration. So I'll, I'll, call, I'll, I'll refer to that phrase sometimes. Um, there's a lot of aggregate evidence. So when you look at just, uh, for example, you know, how much does Portuguese immigration to Canada increase Canadian exports to Portugal? So that kind of data, that kind of evidence is, is present for a lot of different countries. Um, Head and Rice have a paper in 1999 that looks at Canadian data, and they found that at the aggregate level, the elasticity of trade with respect to national immigrant stocks is about 0.1 to 0.3. Um, so Gould does something similar from the US. Perry and Requena Silvente did something similar for Spain. And Bastos and Silva and Rauch and Trinidad did something similar, but looking from the perspective of the Portuguese immigrants and where they go all throughout the world and the Chinese immigrants and where they go all the way throughout the world. Um, so at the aggregate level, it looks like there are important effects. Um, we're going to go down to firm level data and try to look for some similar evidence, uh, evidence of this trade creation effect at the firm level. So we might want to ask, why do we want to do that? Why would we want to go from aggregate to firm level evidence? And I'm going to think about two reasons. There may be lots of reasons. To me, I think two reasons are interesting. One is, at the aggregate level, there's obviously kind of a endogeneity and causality concerns. There are similar factors that promote both trade and migration between countries or, or impede trade and migration between countries. Sorting this out with aggregate data is difficult. Um, and more interestingly, I think, uh, looking at firm level data would help us try to get a little bit more at what the mechanism actually is. When people have in mind that immigrants facilitate trade, I think what they're by and large thinking about is that um, immigrants do this at their workplaces. They provide some information to their employers. Uh, so it's not just the, the presence of immigrants in an economy that makes it you know, easier for any firm to trade. It's that immigrants working at certain firms you know, help, help their employers uh, uh, to export, to trade. Um, so there's a recent literature that's using some firm level data from various countries. So I think uh, most of these are, these are all European countries. So Hiller, I think, is with Danish data. Hatze Georgiou and Lota Falk is looking at Swedish data. Andrews and co-authors are with German data. And uh, Leah Marshall's paper that you're going to see uh, looking at French data. Um, so looking at firm level data, there's, again, there's a different endogeneity issue, which is that you know, firms are choosing to hire immigrants. They're not just randomly assigned across firms. Um, and possibly also immigrants may choose for some reasons to work at firms that are, have a greater propensity to export. So we're going to be a little specific about what that endogeneity issue might be in the framework that we consider and, and how we're going to deal with it. Um, I, I, in this audience, I don't need to really uh, justify the importance of immigration, but I, I, I want to say what's the relevance of this particular topic of, of looking at trade uh, immigrants' effects on trade for migration as a whole. Um, and one thing, the, the, the obvious thing is that there's 
this potential benefit of immigration that it lowers trade barriers that it, you know, it's not really considered in if you, you know, you're missing something if you abstract from this. This suggests that trade and migration can actually be complementary. Um, David Card in his talk yesterday was suggesting that there's a, there's a broad understanding that trade and migration are the same thing, or that they're substitutable. Well, in fact, you know, this kind of channel suggests that they're complementary. Um, and studies of migration often focus on, on, on the effects on natives. Um, so a lot of studies, a lot of papers that we've seen over the past day and a half um, look at labor market effects. Um, actually, these, those three things, David Card, they, they, those are also the things he mentioned, labor market effects, market size effects, and fiscal effects on government budgets, right? So this is all about what trade does to the natives in a country. Um, so this is, a, this is on top of, this trade creation effect is on top of all those things. So uh, Miguel in his job market paper showed that you know, with aggregate data and a, a model you know, using aggregate data, this trade creation effect can have pretty big welfare effects at the aggregate level, especially in countries where there are very, very large diasporas across the world. So in, 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 in relatively small countries that have big emigrant populations spread out a lot of different countries, those, those emigrants are providing a lot of benefits to, to, the, to, to the countries by making it easier for firms to export to their home countries. Okay. So what we're gonna do in this paper is, like I said, we're gonna look at firm level evidence on this trade creation effect um, from administrative Canadian data, employer-employee linked Canadian data. Uh, we're gonna be guided by a model of um, firm destination specific export decisions, so entry sales and immigrant hiring decisions. Um, the the kind of crucial, the main feature here is that there's, firms are gonna face costs that depend on their employees of immigrants from the destination that they're considering exporting to. Okay, so if you are thinking about exporting to India, you face some fixed and variable cost of exporting there that may be affected by whether you uh, employ Indian immigrants in your firm and how many of them you employ. Um, the, the specific way that we're gonna frame this endogeneity issue of you know, for immigrants don't randomly locate across firms is that firms probably have some information on the profitability of exporting to different destinations. So I might know that I'm, I'm, you know, I face particularly high demand for my products in a particular country and if I know that before I make my employment and hiring decisions, then it's gonna make me wanna hire more immigrants. Okay, so um, that's, that's the issue. Uh, we're gonna talk about two different approaches. One is, is kind of a standard in instrumental variable approach that I'll talk about specifically what we do. And the second, which is, more, which is novel to our approach, is using a particular set of restrictions implied by firms' optimal hiring decisions, and that we kind of need our model for. Um, so we're gonna look for, you know, are the aggregate results present at the, at the micro level. And we're gonna talk a little bit about whether there's some evidence of what the underlying mechanisms are. So if, for, if immigrants are helping you communicate or provide information about firms' products to their uh, home country, um, you know, does it show up in, in information that we know about what languages firms speak and de the degree of product differentiation of the, of the products that firms are producing. So there's more differentiated versus more homogeneous products, and we're gonna show that there are differences across um, those two. Okay, so here's the data we're using. We've heard a lot about seed. So we're using seed and we're adding tech. So tech is trade by exporter characteristics, and um, it's export sales for all firms in Canada by destination country at uh, the harmonized six-digit classification. So these are pretty finely uh, disaggregated goods. Harmonized system is, is uh, primarily classified by, by material and method of manufacturing. So that, that's kind of what, what generates very distinct uh, distinctions. And, and it's convenient because the, there's a classification by Rauch uh, on differentiated and homogenous goods at the HS6 division. Um, so we're gonna use firm information, uh, individual information from the T1 tax records and the immigration database that, again, lots of people have talked about today. Um, so we're only gonna look at manufacturing um, for computational reasons. There's a much larger number of firms that we have, but we're gonna focus on manufacturing now. Um, so there's about 50,000 firms, 18,000 export at least once. Um, so that's, that's the data we're looking at. So I'm gonna, just gonna get, so if, we, if we're looking at this trade creation effect, I think we'd like to see it at just a rough you know, summary level first. So I'm gonna show you two graphs that, that try to capture that. 
This is um, on the, the x-axis here is the fraction of firms that export to a certain country. On the y-axis is the fraction of firms that employ a positive number of immigrants from that country that export to that country. Okay, so the, the little red circle here is Denmark, for example. About 1% uh, of firms in Canada export to Denmark. Okay, that's what, that's what this number is. Conditional on having Danish employees, 18% of firms export to Denmark. Okay, so uh, immigrants being associated with firms being more likely to export means being above the 45 degree line here, that's the 45 degree line. So everything, every country is above the 45 degree line. Here's the same thing for, so that's kind of like an extensive margin decision of whether a firm exports or not. This is an, more, an intensive margin decision. This is average uh, relative sale, uh, export sales to a certain country relative to domestic sales in Canada um, by country. And, this is, and the y-axis is the same thing, conditioning on whether you have immigrants from that country in your firm. So again, so look at China over here. Um, the average firm in Canada exports about 1% to China relative to its domestic sales. The average firm that has Chinese immigrants exports about 4% relative to its domestic sales. Okay, so again, everybody's above the 45 degree line, almost. Okay, um, so here's the model framework we're gonna, we're gonna um, do used to try to sort out these effects. Uh, there's gonna be, we're gonna think about monopolistically competitive firms, they're heterogeneous in productivity and in a destination specific uh, demand that they face. So a demand shock that's realized. Um, a bunch of different countries, so K is gonna be, K is countries, one is Canada. So to export any, to any other country, firms are gonna pay fixed and variable costs. So tau is gonna be a variable cost, F is gonna be fixed cost. And we're gonna assume that they take these forms. These are specific functional forms that we're, we're gonna use. Um, each of these costs is composed of two things. One, that's just a country, a destination specific term. These are gonna be things motivated by gravity, the gravity literature. They're gonna be a bunch of destination specific characteristics that have to do with a bunch of different distance measures from Canada. And then a term that depends on how many immigrants you employ. Uh, we do this one plus N for a couple of different reasons. It, it lets us have firms with zero immigrants. Most firm immigrant combinations are zero. They're, it's not gonna be the case that most firms have immigrants from every country, right? Um, so we can have all the zeros in there. Uh, and it's also nice that, that so the, the, the elasticity of each of these costs, the, the, the percentage change in the cost when you add another immigrant declines the more immigrants you hire. I, and I think that's intuitive. If you have 100 immigrants from Portugal and you add one more, they're probably not doing as much to your cost of exporting to Portugal as if you have one immigrant and you add one more. Right. So um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the particular functional form feature we're gonna, we're gonna exploit. Um, the technology is, so this assumption is gonna come in a little bit later. Um, we're gonna assume that immigrants, so NIK is the immigrants that firm I hires from country K. That, we're gonna assume that that's, that uh, output is, uh, they're, they're perfect substitutes. So immigrants from everywhere are perfect substitutes. Um, Okay, so conditional on exporting, firms are gonna face a, a, a downward sloping demand curve. Um, so P is gonna be the price. So this is where the alpha shows up, the, the, the destination specific demand shock. And then this EK is we're gonna proxy with basically aggregate income and the destination. So when we combine this with what monopolistic competition optimal pricing means, uh, you know, firms are gonna price as a markup over their marginal cost of selling somewhere, but that marginal cost includes the variable cost of exporting. Um, this is gonna tell us what sales, what, what a firm will sell to destination K, conditional on actually exporting there. It, um, so it's you know, increasing in productivity, declining in, in the variable cost, and increasing in this destination demand cost. So our model tells us, this is a convenient thing, is that we can use domestic sales to proxy for this productivity term. We don't know this, we don't measure productivity. Um, in the, so, and if we, so if we do that and take logs, it's gonna yield this, follow, this equation. So this is gonna be the basis of one, one method to estimate um, this trade creation effect. Okay, so if we look at conditional on exporting to a certain country, a firm's log export sales there are gonna be related to their domestic sales. That's just a control for size, for productivity. Um, these destination-specific characteristics, 
that have to do with costs, and then the component of costs that have to do with your immigrants, okay? And then um, these two errors. Um, we can say the same thing about entry. So you, you, a firm has to be profitable enough to, entry, to enter because there's a fixed cost. Um, so I, I may not have time for this. So uh, if I have time, I'll show you the results at the end. But um, entry is a probabilistic statement, OK? So if we pretend for a moment that, that you know, there's, there's an error here that's unobserved, if, if your immigrant hiring is just uncorrelated with that, then we could do an OLS on the sales equation and a probit or a linear probability regression on, the entry, on this entry equation to get the estimates of the, of the two costs, OK? So here's that first. Here's the OLS of the export sales equation, just to, to get kind of a, a sense of what the numbers are. Um, so in the, the first column is, uh, the, you know, the green line is, is the, the, the effects on, on log of 1 plus the number of immigrants from that destination. Um, and the dependent variable is, you know, a log of export sales by destination. Okay, so th this is a positive and significant effect. Um, the columns three and four separate into homogeneous and differentiated goods, and that's according to this classification that basically classifies something as homogeneous if it's traded on an organized exchange or with respect to a reference price, a reference market price. Um, and there's big differences between whether a good is, firms are selling homogeneous or differentiated goods. That this effect is insignificant for homogeneous goods. Right? So there's, immigrants are not providing a lot of information, or you, know, you don't need a lot of information or networks to export very homogeneous goods. They're just traded on organized markets. But it's very positive and significant for the differentiated goods. So differentiated goods drive all this. Um, we also do, in addition to thinking about firms employment of immigrants from a particular destination, uh, firms employments of immigrants who speak the language of that destination. Okay, so that's the second line here. And when we add that in, that's also positive and significant. Okay? Um, so it tells you that language is part of what immigrants are doing. They're, they're giving firms language abilities. Uh, all of the rest of these, these are all kind of the gravity variables, and they go in the expected directions. Um, okay, so so the endogeneity problem, that w the way we've cast it is, you know, a firm that, f that expects high demand at a particular destination, it knows that. It knows that hiring more immigrants is gonna make it more profitable to sell there, so it's gonna hire more immigrants, right? So one, one approach to dealing with this that's been used by a few papers in the literature is to use uh, various instruments, and so these papers all use a combination of lagged immigrant employment and uh, basically immigrant employment at the, at the regional or industry level, excluding an individual firm. Um, the idea with the lags is you know, that your past hiring shouldn't affect your current exports as much, but it should affect your current immigrant hiring. Um, and the idea with this um, immigrants at all firms other than yourself is that it's increasing the pool of, you know, it's increasing the pool of migrants from which you can hire, and it's, so it's gonna be correlated with your migrant hiring. Um, so I'll show you some results. I, I think there are issues with both of these. One is that, of course, lags are probably correlated with your current exporting decisions, too. And the other one is, so we're finding that this is just not very correlated with, this is just isn't a very good instrument in, our, in, in, in the Canadian data, um, whereas it seemed to be in, in these papers. Um, so here's, here's the IV results for these two. Uh, so the... The, using lags, you know, you get pretty much the same result as before. Um, using that immigrants at all other firms, we do it at the province and, and NAICS industry level. Um, that becomes negative, so we don't, we're still figuring out the interpretation of that. So, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's a very good uh, instrument in our setting. Okay. Um, this is by product category the homogeneous differentiated, and so that's kind of the same thing. The, the effect is much smaller for homogeneous than it is for differentiated, but again, this, um, this uh, NI minus IK, all other firms, doesn't seem to be going in the right direction, so that's yeah, something we're still sorting out to some extent. So we're gonna take a bit of a different approach um, to, or suggest a different approach to deal with this um, endogeneity issue, and it's the following. Um, we're gonna actually take into account that explicitly that problem of firms choosing, you know, their, their, the composition of their uh, employees from the different countries where they hire from. 
So firms are going to face a problem where they maximize profits by choosing their inputs, taking into account that those uh, immigrant employment numbers affect their costs of exporting everywhere. Um, I won't go through all the details of setting up that problem. What we end up with is basically a first order condition for uh, an optimality condition for choosing immigrants by, by source country. Um, it's not going to have this unobserved, the thing that's known to the firm but unobserved to us, it's the alpha, it's not going to be there. So what, and it's gonna, what it's, this is going to do is relate the share of wage payments to immigrants from a certain country to the elasticities of the cost function. So this is, this is the equation we end up with. And I'll, I'll describe these, what this means a little bit. If you turn off these two terms, say that immigrants don't do anything to your trade costs, all this is saying is that the fraction of your revenue, of your total sales that you pay to immigrants from country K are just equal to their, their fraction of representation in your workforce. And that's because they're perfect substitutes. When you add in the potential that they reduce your trade costs, then, then you add on the elasticity of, the, of those trade costs. Okay? Um, the logic of why this seems to solve our endogeneity problem is that this is just an ex now an additional restriction imposed by optimal behavior that we didn't have before. Okay? So we're using the, this behavioral restriction uh, to, to impose some more structure. Um, an a, a, a pretty close analog um, from, from uh, Industrial from production function estimation is equating input expenditure shares to production function parameters. So, you know, if you have a Cobb Douglas production function with some unobserved productivity and exponents on labor, capital, whatever the other inputs are, the share of revenues that go to wages equal the exponent on, on labor. Doesn't matter if productivity is unobserved. That's exactly what's going on here, essentially. Um, so, this goes back to solo or possibly earlier and a, a recent paper that exploits this in a much more sophisticated way is uh, Gandhi Navarro Rivers on productivity estimation. Okay, so here's, um, so this is a nonlinear equation now. We, we estimate it by nonlinear least squares. Um, the, I, I guess I should say, so one thing I wanna isolate here is how, why do we, how do we get these two different things? Well, the important thing here is that the elasticity of the variable cost interacts with the, with the export sales, right? You only get this variable cost reduction to the extent that you're selling stuff to that country, the XIK. The reduction in the fixed cost when you hire more migrants, that's cash in your pocket. That's, you know, cash in the firm's pocket. They reduce their fixed cost. So that doesn't interact with sales. So that's why we can identify these two things separately from one regression, essentially. So we do non, a nonlinear least squares regression, and these are the actual um, cost function elasticities, the epsilons that are in the one plus n to the minus epsilon, right? So, um, so this is positive and significant. It's much smaller than what we had before um, for a couple of reasons. One is that that, was, that had this, an elasticity of substitution in it too. But, um, and we have the same pattern across homogeneous and differentiated. So the differentiated, the homogeneous is smaller and, and negative. The, homo the differentiated one is bigger. Um, all the distant stuff remains the same. Uh, our elasticity of the fixed cost is not really the right sign. So we're still working on this. Um, one issue here is everything, this, deriving this is conditional on making export sales to a country. And that's actually not taking into account all the effects that immigrants should be having on, on your actual propensity to actually export somewhere. So taking into account the extensive margin might change that and might get us a fixed cost term that's more sensible. Um, but it's very interesting. I think we find it very informative that we can get, some, we can get positive and significant estimates out of, for the elasticity of the variable cost out of this, out of this method, okay? Um, Oh, so I have a minute. I'll just say, so these are the linear probability model estimates. Um, so these are marginal effects. They're, if you increase one plus, you know, one plus your number of immigrants, there's a positive effect on, on exporting, uh, exporting to a destination. And the same thing, so the language effect is there again. Langu immigrants with a certain language skill are providing some benefit, even if they're not from the destination country. Um, and this is the same thing with a lagged immigrant instrument. Okay, so again, that, that effect is positive and significant. Okay. 
So what have we found? We found that there's a big pro-trade immigrant effect, a trade creation effect of immigration at the firm level. Um, the elasticity of export sales with respect to immigrants is not too far off from the aggregate numbers that I showed you, like in the range of 0.3. Um, language is important, so language is, is, is an important kind of method of communication or it's providing some benefits to, to firms. And there's much bigger impacts for differentiated versus homogenous goods, which is telling us that you know, this, the degree of information, we know differentiated goods, there's more information is more important for those goods, so this suggests what kinds of mechanisms immig immigrants are doing or providing. Um, and we find it useful to use these restrictions implied by the theory of the firm's uh, hiring choices in, in sorting out these effects. Okay. Thanks.